Father God, I thank you right now for Greg. I thank you for everything that he's doing for the kingdom of God. We come against every demonic assignment. We bind and restrict any demonic entity that would try and interrupt this recording right now in the name of Jesus Christ. We bind you. We annihilate you. We say that you are restricted. We restrict all access. We send forth angels to ascend and descend. Cover us with the blood of Christ. We speak and decree that this communication and this broadcast will go out and change lives, mm. change mm. lives far and wide. Father God, that even as we're bringing the bold truth, they're going to feel love. They're going to feel deliverance. They're going to feel healing. They're going to get their questions answered. And I just ask that you have everyone watch and listen to this, that you orchestrate this moment and it brings love lasting change to them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to the Prophetic Spiritual Warfare Podcast with host Kathy DeGraw. Well, friends, I want to welcome you back to my show. I am so excited today. I have Pastor Greg Locke with us. Guys, we're going to give you some healing, some teaching, some scripture, some words, some freedom, some deliverance. Pastor Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. I am excited. You are doing some amazing work around the globe. Friends, um, you can see Pastor Greg, we're going to put all those links down in, but he has, you know, a revival deliverance service every Sunday night. He has books. He has everything. He's reading the scripture. I love that. I don't think I've ever seen anyone read the scripture on their social page. What inspired you? You know, I just wanted to really get our people this year into the word of God. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to challenge them to read the Bible through individually, like personally, every single month. And so we actually started in December. So I told him I wanted to do it 13 times. And we had a lot of people sign up to do it. And then I thought, you know what? One of those times, I'm just going to do it with the entire church under the tent. I thought that was significant, just to kind of read it out loud into the atmosphere, you know? And so we've just been mashing the gas. And so with sickness, with the tent falling down, we're still going to get through it. And uh, we just sit there and I'll come in every night for two, three, four hours. I I've even done it for eight or 10 hours and just sit there on the platform and just read, 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 read. And hundreds of people watch online, people come into the tent. And it's just, it's really been amazing to do it. And then while we're doing that, I still have myself and the people on their own personal journey of still reading through. And so it's, it's been powerful. So we've been able to catch a lot of things that were in the Bible the whole time that you never really recognized. That's great. I know I'm reading through a different translation than I usually do right now. I'm actually reading through um, a complete Jewish uh, translation because I'm like, God, I want to yeah. know nugget. I want yeah. something different, you mm -hmm. know, because I think we get caught up sometimes and, oh, I know this. And then, you know, our flesh just kind of breezes by it. And I'm like, yep. I want a nugget. I want something yep. new. Amen. Amen. So let's let's talk. I want to hit that though a minute. I wasn't even planning this. I guess Holy Ghost is. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Pastor, people don't read the Bible. Tongue talking, yeah. spirit filled uh -huh. Christians aren't reading the Bible. Uh, what do you got to say about that? What is you know, how can you ignite them, stir them? Well, one of the things that I was shocked and probably shouldn't have been is how much just vitriolic pushback we got when I got up and said, Hey, I want to challenge our people to read the Bible in a month. I mean, the internet lit up like a Christmas tree and people are like, well, you can't read it that fast. You can't retain it like that. Why would you do that? And I'm like, if you're actually reading the Bible yourself, why would you care how fast we read the Bible? Okay, I don't care how fast you do it or how slow you do it. The fact is, if you're complaining about it, you're not doing it at all, right? That's and right. So Speak. what I want to create are people kind of like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, right? In Luke chapter 24, they said, did not our hearts burn within us when he spoke the word of God to us? And I believe we need to develop some holy heartburn, right? That's a phrase we oh, use around Global good. Vision. We need some holy heartburn for the Bible because people are not only Bible ignorant, they're Bible disobedient because oh. the only parts of the Bible you really believe are the parts of the Bible that you really behave, right? James 1, be doers of the right. word and not hearers only. And it's interesting to me that, you know, you take Psalm 1, 1 through 3, you take Joshua 1, 8. Those are two passages that promise, right? Promise, Jeremiah 15, 16, that there will be success and prosperity if you read the word of God. And it's like the only thing God says about his word, I will prosper and give you success and you will bear fruit. And yet people sit around, twiddle their thumbs, 
stay on TikTok and Instagram all day long, binge watch Netflix till three in the morning, and then get mad when a preacher says, hey, why don't you read 39 chapters of the Bible a day? It'll take you two hours. And people have a glorified meltdown because people do not have the discipline to read the word of God. And so it all boils down to one thing. If you are not in God's word, you are not in God's will. 100%, no way around that fact. That that is so good. And you know, that's what I think a lot of people's issues are is you want to get healed, you're suffering with a mind-binding demon, you want deliverance, but it all comes in the word of God. Amen. And that's the Amen. foundation. And if you're not yes. in that word, you know, this is what the Lord told me years ago. I, I honestly I wish I was obedient to it as I should have been. But he said, Kathy, he said, if you fill your mind up so full of the word of God, there will be no yes. room for the enemy to torment you. Amen. I Amen. mean, that Absolutely. is true. Because then what? We can just fire off that word. We know our identity. We know our authority. We know our inheritance. And so, friends, I want to encourage you. Get in that word. Get in that word. Yes. All right. We're going to go on. Okay. So let's talk. Let's like lay this out. A Christian can't be demonized. A Christian can't have a demon. Let's end this debate once and for all. Yeah. A Christian can have anything they want, including an evil <laughs> spirit. And we do have them. There is no doubt about it, right? right? A Christian cannot be subjugated or possessed by a demon, but we certainly can be oppressed by demons. And you know, one of the, one of the most simplistic understandings of that study is the armor of God. The armor of God, number one, is only for believers. And the armor of God, number two, is only for one reason. It's not for the culture, it's not for the flesh, and it's not for the world. It's so that we can push back the attacks, the oppression, the fiery darts of the evil one, of Satan, of the wicked one, the Bible says in Ephesians 6. And so if we can't be attacked by demons, then why are we even supposed to walk in the fullness of the Spirit, pray in the Spirit, and wear the armor of God? It's because we can be under affliction. We can have a spirit of heaviness, Isaiah 61 and verse four. We can have, 2 Timothy, a spirit of fear. There's no doubt about it. So here's what people say. Well, you know, I just, I just don't believe a Christian can have a demon. Here's what I tell them. A demon just told you that, <laughs> okay? A demon just told you that. So here's how you end the debate, it's especially when pastors say it, because they say, well, you know, I just, I just don't believe a Christian can have a demon. What they mean when they say that is they don't believe they can have they a demon. They can have That's a demon. That, that is right? absolutely 100%. right. 100%. And, and so, friends, you know, we get so hung up on that word possessed. You know, everyone's yeah. like, a Christian can't be possessed. And I've got taught you guys about that before. It's in one of my books. You know, you cannot be possessed. You know, get out of that terminology. Possessed means yeah. occupied in a place. And so look at the definitions so that that you know, okay, you can't be possessed, but it can come after you. But you just hit on my next question because again, oh my goodness, it just seems like this is blowing up in the last week. I've been asking people, have spirit-filled, tongue-talking Christians who believe in deliverance ministry because they're following me a demon slayer, but they haven't had deliverance. So I know, I, I know, you know, and I'm like, well, have you had deliverance? Well, I might have had a spirit of anger cast out of me. And I'm like, I, I believe every believer needs deliverance. And so what do you say to these people? How can you help get it through their thick skull that yeah. you can't just believe in deliverance if you don't believe deliverance is for you or you don't go through the process? You know, when we first got literally baptized into the ministry of deliverance, it happened so quick. We started doing deliverance and it didn't take but maybe a little less than a month for me to realize, you know what? Our team needs to go through deliverance. Me and my wife need to go through personal deliverance. We had uh, my friend, Pastor Henry Schaefer, come in and we went through it ourselves. And it's amazing how you see things differently, right? And so I tell people, if you're not going to walk in holiness, if you're not going to walk in the fear of the Lord, if you're not going to you know, walk in the word of God, don't get involved in deliverance ministry. It'll be the worst thing that ever happened to you because those demons are going to absolutely destroy you. So if you don't have the ability 
to be able to, number one, understand what people are going through. You're not going to be empathetic. You're not going to be compassionate because deliverance ministry is not about, you know, putting cameras in people's faces and burping and throwing up and levitating off the floor. It's about compassion. It's about loving people enough that you no longer want them demonized. You no longer want them under the authority and the oppression and depression of those enemies. And so it's an attack, ladies and gentlemen. It really is an attack. And so once you recognize that, you want to be ready. And so anybody that says things like, well, you know, uh, I love the Lord, but I don't go to church. I love the Lord, but I don't read the Bible. I, I love the Lord, but I believe I can, you know, live in sin and live in ungodliness. That's foolish. And it's the same way for saying, I believe in deliverance, but I've never gone through deliverance. That's, that's nonsense. There's no such thing, okay? There's no such creature on the planet. Because if you do not go through deliverance, you are going to be susceptible to the same things that you're dealing with other people about. And so I think it's very important that you go through some deliverance, you go through some, some trauma healing, some inner healing, and you understand the inner workings. Because if you don't know how demons have tricked you, you're never going to have a discerning of spirits, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, to know how they're tricking other people. So I highly recommend folks go through personal deliverance, sit through a mass deliverance. We don't let anybody on our prayer team, on our deliverance team that works with other people with evil spirits and curses unless they themselves have had the same things broke off them and cast out of them. It's important, vitally important. I can't stress enough how important it is. It is important. And, and you know, I heard this a long time ago. I really think it's true. And friends, so I say to you, if you are like so agitated because somebody's controlling in your life, sometimes that's something that we got to look at at our own selves, you know, is that agitating us so much because it's really a reflection of us or something mm -hmm. we need healing and deliverance from. And people get yeah. mad at me and they're like, oh no, they're just irritating me. Well, why are you allowing that? Is there an irritation, mm -hmm. you know, irritation, uh, fear, anger, all of those are intertwined. And so we want to look at that. And, you know, my prayer has always been, you know, Psalm 51, 10, create in me a clean heart and Holy Spirit, just come in, peel me back like an iron layer yeah. by layer. So there's nothing left but you and friends, really, we got to take that plank out of our eye. We really got to allow that deliverance to come upon us. And so I want to encourage you, if you have never had a deliverance session, if you've never had a demon cast out, you know, we're going to get into generational curses here next. You know, you don't have to live with your mom's depression. You don't have yeah. to live with your dad's anger. You don't have to. That is a curse that needs to be broken. We do not have to live in that bondage, whether it's physical, whether it's health, you know, mental and we have to get it out. And so I want to encourage you to really sit before the Holy Spirit. You know, I spent two years of my life prostrate on the carpet. Nobody delivered me, but I went to the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not saying you don't need a deliverance minister. Obviously, God has put us on the earth for a reason. But start by going to the Holy Spirit and saying, Holy yeah. Spirit, what needs to be rooted out of me? What needs to be gutted out of me? What's in me? I mean, I remember, Pastor Greg, you know, I had control and pride and my apostolic yeah. leader and my <laughs> husband would be like, you got control, you got pride. And I was like, I don't, uh -huh. no, I don't. And I'll tell you, Pastor Greg, I was casting out demons, thousands of deliverance, casting out demons with the spirit of pride. And one day, I don't even know what I was doing. And I felt that demon just roll in my gut and manifest mm. up and out of me. And so friends, I say that to you to show yeah. you a tongue talking deliverance minister can have a demon. You can have one too. Amen. All right. Generational curses. Mm. Um, wow. You know, people are living with depression, anger. They're living with high blood pressure, all of this. Can you give them like a couple quick PowerPoints? How do you break that off? I think what I have found in ministry is people are just going to the altar and someone's saying all generational curses be gone in Jesus name, but they're not going, you know, yeah. it's, it's not that simple unless the glory of God is there. You know, there's an anointing, the manifest presence of God is there, but so many people are like, oh yeah, that broke off. And I'll be like, well, are you still on high blood pressure medicine from your mom? They'll be like, yeah. And I'm like, well, there's still something here. So how yeah. do you get a few PowerPoints for them to get that freedom? Well, a couple of things about generational curses. Everybody wants to preach about generational blessing, but nobody wants to believe in generational cursing, but you can't have one without the other, right? 
And so when it comes to curses, here's what people have to recognize. A church service, a, a, a prayer meeting, having someone lay hands on you, repenting of something, what we do in that is we deal with the fruit of the situation. When you deal with a generational curse, you deal with the root of the situation. All right, you got to go back and figure out what caused this. Now, you That's may not right. be able to go back in the bloodline 50 generations and figure it out. But what you will find is that there is a reoccurring. That's why it's a curse. There's a reoccurring problem. There's a reoccurring habitual sin. There's continual uh, divorce in the bloodline on either side of the family. There's continual sickness, continual mental deficiencies or depression, or like you said, high blood pressure. And here's the sad fact of the matter. When you go to a doctor, they don't call it deliverance ministry, but most doctors believe in deliverance ministry more than most pastors. Because when you sit down, they give you a piece of paper, and here's what it says. Do you have high blood pressure? Has anybody in your family ever committed suicide? Has anybody That's ever had right. cancer, heart disease, heart attack? What they're looking for is a generational curse. We just call yeah. it hereditary. But if you read Deuteronomy chapter 28, there are seven massive curses that are pronounced upon people. And then the way to break those curses but because people want to ignore that, well, I can't be under a generational curse. No, you are under a generational curse. There's no doubt. Every believer has some sort of bloodline curse that's, that's right. going to have to be broken. Come on, And come we can on. talk about these for a long time. And there's a lot of books. Jesus. You know, my friend Alexander Pagani just put out the book yep. on generational curses. And, you know, Derek Prince is probably the best in the world on generational curses. Yeah. But what, what I find is that it's easy to dismiss it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not under a curse. You know, I just, I'm, I'm just mad. My mom was a mad person. My grandmother was a mad person. I'm, it's just the way that I am. It's, it's just in my DNA. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's in your bloodline because it's an altar that you need to burn, right? It is a curse that you are going to have to break off. And so there's a difference people need to understand between deliverance from a demon and the breaking off of a yes. generational curse. Come on, go see, there. Demons ride the line of generational curses because demons don't care about you and me. They care about our children and our children's children's children. That's what they want. They want our kids. They want our grandkids. Mm. They want our great grandkids. And so that's why the curse has to be broken because when the curse is broken, the door is shut and the demons are no longer able to gain access to you or mm. to your bloodline or to the next generation. And although it's probably uber controversial, anybody in deliverance ministry that will be honest and biblical and will be bold will agree with the fact that the number one generational curse, it's crazy, but the number one generational curse, or at least the reason for a generational curse that people are under is because of things like the Masonic Lodge and yes. witchcraft and secret society oaths. When people are involved in that stuff, it affects us, our marriage, right. our kids, and our kids, kids, kids. And if we don't stand up and say, in the name of Jesus, I disconnect myself from that covenant. I break off that bloodline curse that my great-great-grandmother and great-great-grandfather started for me. When you break it off, sometimes deliverance ministry is as easy as breaking that curse and immediately there's a peace that comes over you, that sickness goes away, because something gave that demon authority, right? And it was a curse. Right. And if you don't break off the curse, you're never going to get rid of the demon. And you got to do it audibly, friends. Okay, you can't yes. just pray that in your mind. You <laughs> right. have to speak it out. And I think yes, that's another reason, you know, people aren't getting deliverance pastors because they're just sitting there, you know, back in yes. their chair comfy or being passive. But it's about that outspoken word. You know, when we look at Jesus, you know, he spoke things out. He rebuked yes. demons. It was all audibly. David, he cried. He said, he called out, spoke. Those are all audible commands. Our father, God created the world with that outspoken word. And so we have to be speaking that out. And you know, I've said that, um, you guys know my book, Mind Battles, I keep telling you, you gotta break agreement. You have to yes. break agreement. And so if you're Amen. thinking that those generational curse, I could just cast out a spirit of sickness, no. There yeah. is a process that you have to go through. And so I encourage you, get up, get on your feet even, you know, get violent yeah. against those curses and break them off. You know, I'm, I'm a grandma now and, and I just love to, you know, look at the two-year-old granddaughter. I mean, we have her anointing people with oil already saying, you know, yeah. be healed in Jesus name. And mm -hmm. when I look at her, you know, I think, 
it's such a blessing that I get to do life right this time, you know, because when I had kids, you know, we were Christians, but not like we were now. And we get a yeah. second chance. And friends, that's what your prayers do. It gives Amen. your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, it gives them that that chance. And, you know, my daughter was in fear. I was in fear. Uh, that's the one that was my stronghold that the enemy bound mm. me with. And, you know, she was struggling with fear and we had taken her through deliverance, but you know, she had some rumination and some old yeah. thought patterns that she had to re renew it. I'm like, we need to get your deliverance before this child is born. You know, we need to just get this to be a blessing line and not this curse that goes down. So friends, it is, it is Amen. so true. Um, so let's, let's go to how, you know, um, I had this one just today. Well, Jesus hmm. took all the curses at the cross. It's all I have to do is uh -huh. receive it. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, that, that's a, uh, that's a good one. That that's religious uh, jargon is what that is because <laughs> yes, Jesus did become a curse because the Bible says in Deuteronomy, cursed is everyone that hangs on yes, a tree, hangs he on that knew tree. no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so, yes, we understand the fact that Jesus died as a curse. But we also understand the fact that Jesus died for the sins of the world, but that does not mean that the world is saved. If you don't appropriate the work of the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus, you're still going to go to hell when you die, right? You have to accept the work. You have to mm -hmm. appropriate what he did. So yeah, he died for our sins, but you still have to be saved. And yes, he died to take away the curse, but you still have to appropriate the work. And so yes, you can be saved from your sin, going to heaven, talk in tongues and do anything you jolly well please and still be under a generational curse. And it's why people are so miserable. And that's why, like you said a moment ago, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. When we take right. people through deliverance, especially in mass deliverance, if they're going to participate, they got to do it out loud. You don't get to think yes. stuff in your head, right? You yes. got to break covenant. You got to break contract. You got to break Ooh. agreement with the enemy. Jesus. Because if you don't, they're going to stay there. You can put it in your head all you want to. But until you say it with your mouth, okay, it's so important that you say it with your mouth. And so there are so many people that just don't understand that the reason they are still in bondage is because of this very discussion that we are having this very moment right now. Mm, yeah. Come on, guys. You got to share this. You're going to share this TV, this YouTube, everything, every place we put this, Facebook, uh, podcast, every platform, guys, that this is on. You have to share this. This is crucial because so many people are asking these questions. Okay, mm -hmm. let's talk about this to wrap it up. Fear, torment, mind-binding mm -hmm. demons. It's kind of been my platform all these years. Yeah. But I want you to give my uh, followers something that they don't know about when they've had that spirit of fear, that torment, that mind-binding demon. Maybe they're 90% free or 80% free. But let's yeah. just say it still it locks them down. You know, they get to that point where, you know, maybe I say they feel emotionally or even spiritually paralyzed. They can't pray. Yeah. They're worried about something. The finances, a bad uh, diagnosis comes from the doctor. How do you pull yourself out of that? How do you get that final deliverance from fear, torment, mind-binding demons? Yep. Well, people need to understand that we do have to cast out imaginations and every high thing that exalts Ooh, itself against the knowledge yeah. of God because what happens with curses and demons is they develop a stronghold within us, right? And mm -hmm. nine times out of 10, and if not almost 10 times out of 10, that stronghold is going to be a mind stronghold, right? There are mm -hmm. these mind binding demons. There are these mind controlling demons because it's all in your mind. Your heart and your mind are interchangeable in the Bible, in the Bible right? He's not talking about your brain. He's not talking about your, your pumping organ. He's talking about the inner part of man. And when yes. the enemy comes in and he starts to change your mind about things and conflict your mind and give you this confusion. I'm telling you, the spirit of confusion and chaos is running rampant in this <laughs> culture, in the church world. And so much of it does have to do with fear, because I, I think fear is probably the number one, if not fear and heaviness, the number one demons, evil spirits that the church world deals with. That's why Paul said to Timothy, yeah. God's not giving you the spirit of fear. He doesn't call right. it an atmosphere. He doesn't call it an attitude. He calls it a spirit because it's demonic. Because fear will cause you to do things that you would not do otherwise, right? You, you'll make weird choices and you, you'll fear things that you should never fear. If you look at an encyclopedia or if you get on Google, there are tens of thousands of what we call phobias. Some are huge, yeah. 
some are small. But if you go through deliverance and you get deliverance from a spirit of fear, those phobias will leave you. There is no doubt. Amen. I mean, it can be as small. People might think this is crazy. When I went through deliverance, you know, I had a lot of rejection and a lot of religion. But fear did come out in, in various areas. And it's not like they called out every single phobia. But I had a crippling fear, as crazy as it is, crippling fear for years of spiders. I had the worst case of arachnophobia you could ever imagine. I couldn't watch a National Geographic special without having spider nightmares for the next six weeks, right? <laughs> I mean, I would think they're in the bed. You know, I mean, I'm a grown man, pastor in a big church, and I'm scared of spiders. But when I went through deliverance, personal deliverance, when the spirit of fear came out, I could pick up five tarantulas right now and it not even bother me. It's not that I yeah. have to, right? I'm not going to go get a spider for a pet, but it doesn't bother me anymore. My, my wife used to have this reoccurring dream. She had it since she was a little kid of snakes crawling up a four poster bed, trying to get to her. Right. And for years she was terrified. She had that dream over sometimes weekly for years over and over when she went through, you know, coming the spirit of fear coming out through deliverance. She has never again had that dream. She doesn't fear snakes anymore. You know, she's not like Indiana Jones freaking out every time somebody talks about <laughs> a snake. It's crazy because fear grips people. But here's what people don't recognize. In first John, the Bible says that fear has torment. So the reason people are tormented by demons is because the spirit of fear has gained access to you somehow. But here's what the Bible says. Perfect love casts out fear, right? So it's not always just screaming into a camera or a microphone, come out, spirit of fear, come out, spirit of fear. Here's what I found. One of the biggest ways to combat fear is to immerse people in the love of the Father. And when mm -hmm. people understand just how received of the Father they are, and they receive that spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. the spirit of fear cannot withstand that. The spirit of fear is choked. And that's why the perfect love of God casts out fear. I have literally, people can laugh all they want to, I have literally hugged a demon out of somebody during mm -hmm. a deliverance session as I have yep. just immersed them in the love yes. of the father. And that demon just, pow, just comes right out. And so fear is something that all of us struggle with, but you can know when those feelings rise up, it's demonic. It is a hundred percent demonic. And that's so true, friends. I want to, you know, go on a few things. He said, by the spirit that we cry out, Abba, Father, Romans 8, 15, you know, that's mm. been one of the verses that I always say, especially when dealing with a generational curse, my fear yeah. was generational. And so I've been like, I've been given a royal priesthood. I'm adopted by the father. I have a new bloodline, mm. you know? And so that scripture really does help. And I believe that filling up with love, but what we've done, and, and this is really what Pastor Greg is also saying, you know, sometimes I think you guys want to cast out a demon more than you want to change your inner thoughts. Yeah. You know, it's, <laughs> it's true. It's like, well, it's a quick fix. Let me just cast this demon out. But uh, guys, you know, I wrote the book on it. Okay. Cause I lived it, but it's really rumination. God has made our mind neuroplastic. So it's ever changing. And some of those thoughts are just you and you got to fight those thoughts. You got to yes. fight through the torment, you know, second Corinthians 10, you know, uh, four and five, take every thought captive. And when you study that out, it actually says, does it obey the Messiah? Does it submit to the word of God? And that's yeah. what you have to do. And that's a behavior pattern. That's a habit. That's what Pastor Greg said at the beginning. It's inner healing. You know, it's it's our homework is what it, I call it. I say every time we walk out that stronghold, we walk out that thought, we just show the devil and his demons. I walked it out. I did my homework. Yeah. You have no hold on me friends, you got some work to do. And so yes. I want to encourage you, you know, get in the word, get in your prayer closet, seek the Holy Spirit. This is great. We have deliverance ministries and ministers, but you also need to do some work on yes. your own. <laughs> Amen. Pastor Greg, any closing thoughts? Well, I just want people to understand, you know, not everything's a demon. Not everything's yes. a curse. Sometimes you don't need deliverance. You need discipline, right? Yes. And so like you said earlier, <laughs> deliverance can be progressive. Sometimes it can be a one and done, but it's not a one-stop shop, right? We need discipleship in the body of Christ. Yes. And the discerning of spirits and the ability and authority to cast them out is just part of that discipleship process.
And so mm. a lot of times people are like, you know, my kids need deliverance. My kids need deliverance. I'm like, no, your kids need a whooping, right? <laughs> you, you need some discipline in your house is what they need. And so not everything is demonic. But if you don't have any discipline, I promise you, you are going to be under the control of the enemy because he is going to destroy your mind. And so just remember, and we've said this, but I think it's important that you understand in deliverance ministry, we're dealing with three things, right? We're casting out demons. We're pulling down strongholds. We're breaking off generational curses. Three very different things, but very important. And we have authority in the name of Jesus over all of them. I, I love that. I want to reiterate something, guys, here. Deliverance and discipleship go hand mm. in hand. Yes. It's going to do you no good to get deliverance if you're not in a good church, if you're Amen. not in a, you know, with a good ministry, getting that deep discipleship. And the Holy Spirit told me that years ago. Charisma Magazine had asked me to write an article years ago, and they said, Kathy, what is the church missing? And I'm like, mm. that's easy, deliverance. <clears throat> and the Holy yeah. Spirit said, no, Kathy, I don't want you to write mm. on deliverance. He said, I want you to write that the church is missing discipleship. Amen. And yeah. you guys need it. And so get your deliverance, get that discipleship, and discipline, those three Ds, and then Amen. take that and do what Jesus said, go out and make disciples. Amen. Pastor Greg Locke, I love you. God bless you, man. Thank, of God. You, so Thank much. you so much for being on. I'm honored. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Prophetic Spiritual Warfare Podcast. Receive additional teaching through Kathy's Web Church Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube and Facebook, or through her Prophetic Spiritual Warfare book. I invite you to visit kathydegrawministries.org for books, mentoring, blogs, or to invite Kathy to speak at your event. Follow Kathy on Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram at Kathy DeGraw. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate, and review the show. This helps our show rise in the rankings and reach more people to bring forth deliverance.